Hey everyone, welcome back. In the last video, we have built the structure of the bodice. We've gone ahead and boned it and sewn it together and created the actual structure that the cover will be going over. And in this video, we'll continue that process now working on the velvet cover. If you haven't already seen part one, I'm putting the link down below in the description. Feel free to check it out. It gives you a really good play-by-play -play on exactly how I created the structure for this bodice. The pattern I'm using is Sofia Magdalinda's wedding gown from 1766. It's a court dress and it's an absolutely stunning pattern. You can find the pattern for it in Patterns of Fashion 5. So at this point, I am creating the new pattern for the cover. If you notice in the original sketch of the garment, you can see that the outer bodice is only four pieces while the inner bodice is five. So we now have to manipulate the pattern to basically eliminate one of the seams and thusly one of the pieces. This can be a bit of a tricky process. There's a lot of pivoting involved and a lot of maneuvering the pieces to create the correct shape and also fit the bodice in the correct way so that it fits nicely over the stays underneath. Hey everyone, so we're back. We have gotten the stays finished, the guts are done, all of the structure is put in. Now we have to cover the skirts. So they were covered traditionally separately when you did a smooth covered stay. So instead of using the thick black velvet that I'm using, I'm gonna use a different fabric, it's a silk. Um, they didn't want to use their expensive face fabric to cover something that wasn't going to be seen anyway So they would have used something different So that's how we're going to do these and we're going to work on doing that and then I'll show you how it's done So the process of covering the skirts is pretty simple. You basically take a scrap piece of fabric, usually in this period it would be a silk or a linen, and you would measure your skirt and you would basically create a square that would then cover it. I then take that piece of fabric and apply it to the skirts using a basting stitch. Um, here I'm using a diagonal basting stitch, making sure to curl the skirt while you're basting it the best you can. It's a little tough to do. You want to do that to prevent any sort of wrinkling when the stays are worn. After I finish basting, I then go around and trim the excess from around the skirt and the split. Being careful to only go up to the split because you're going to need the rest to fold under so that way you can slip stitch these pieces together. Once I do that, I then go around and whip stitch the piece into place and then you're done. And then you move on to the next skirt and the next skirt and the next skirt and the next skirt.
looking back, what I've learned is that I probably should have done this part last in my particular case. Traditionally, they would have been done first. You'll see why in a later part of the video. Once I finish the skirts, it's time to bind the stays. This is done by using a 3 8 inch Peter Sham ribbon. It's really important to get the right type of ribbon for this particular use. A braid is really good for this. Also the Peter Sham ribbon, it's the ribbon with the scallops on the edge. It looks like grosgrain, but it's not quite. That'll allow you to shape and mold it around these tight corners. And another trick you want to remember is to keep the ribbon as narrow as possible. This will allow you to get up into those tiny little portions of the skirts that you need to sort of get around and tuck that extra into. Morgan Donner has a really great video on exactly how to do this. I tried to catch it in my video, but unfortunately my hands were getting in the way and it was really hard to see. So I'm going to link her video down in the description below and she has a really great way of doing this. So now that I've finished the skirts and the binding, it's time to check the pattern for the cover on the actual stays. I did this by cutting out the pattern and taping it to the bodice. This will help me sort of judge where I need to add, subtract parts of the pattern pieces to make sure that it'll fit over the bodice. This is done as a preliminary caution to make sure that none of the pieces are too small. But as you can see later on in the video, you're still going to have to make adjustments even in the final piece. So make sure you leave enough seam allowance when you're cutting the pieces out. Something you want to remember about velvet is that it has a nap to it and this is done in the finishing process when they go to split the two panels of velvet apart from each other. There is a roller going in one direction across the velvet which creates the nap that also goes in that direction. So it's really important to make sure all of your pieces are following the same direction. Now in my particular case I wanted the velvet to look really dark and really lush so I decided to go against the nap. 
This means when you run your hand down the dress, you can feel the nap pulling against your hand. If it was going in the other direction, it would feel smooth. That way you would know that the nap is going down with the dress. So it's really important to run your hand over the velvet ahead of time and then mark your velvet with arrows on the back side to tell you which direction the velvet's running. Now it's time to baste all the pieces together and check the fit. Again, you can see that I've left a considerable amount of seam allowance all the way around each piece. This is going to make it very helpful for me to be able to adjust all the pieces and adjust the sizing on the actual form. So that way there's no wrinkles and then there's also no chance of it being too small. Okay everyone, so what I've done is I've gone through and basted the bodice together. I then put it on the form and put it on my stays and pinned out everywhere that needed to be pinned out. I then left it overnight. That lets it, you know, lets the fabric relax. Um, what that does is once the fabric's relaxed, I can then take out a little bit more. You know, you can sort of see there's a bit of give here. That's gonna be really important for the longevity of the piece. If you don't let it relax, what's gonna happen is it's gonna stretch over time as you're wearing it, it's gonna start to get a little lumpy. Now that I've done that, I'm gonna go in, take out all these extra little bits that are, um, you know, a little too much. Obviously that's too much. Take it out, rebaste it, baste it to the stays, and then do a fitting with the model. Don't get too discouraged if your cover doesn't fit after the first try, they never do. As you're trying these on and you are playing with them and sewing them and trying them on and fitting them, they tend to stretch a little bit, move a little bit, and it's just, it's never gonna be perfect. So I leave generous seam allowances everywhere and that really helps sort of readjust these patterns. So instead of out the basting completely what I'm doing here is I'm actually clipping it apart and basically leaving a tailor stack this will mark the fabric and make sure that I know exactly where that seam allowance was so that while I continue to take it in or take it out I have a general idea of where my pattern started so that way I know if I'm going a little too far it'll also help me balance each side to make sure that each side is even Here's that really fun part where you can see me taking out the excess from the back panel that I had added in after I had checked the pattern on the stays using the paper pattern. So you know, 100% not a science, but in the end it works out. At this point, after I've backstitched all the panels together, I am now going to the peak of the bodice and I am tracing out the seam allowance line. I will then do a running stitch from one side to the other side and gently ease the seam allowance into that curve. So that way I can then fold it back neatly and apply it to the front of the bodice.
Just a quick pro tip, if you don't have a velvet board, which I do not, don't really worry about it too much. A simple towel, as long as it's a terry cloth towel, will do. That'll give you enough loft for the velvet fibers to sort of work their way into so you don't crush them. Hey everyone, so we're back. This is been an endless process of just tweaking and pulling and tucking and pinching just to get it smooth. Um, we have gotten it pretty smooth. I'm pretty happy with it. I'm just praying at this point that it will work on the body as well as it's working on the mannequin. I don't think it should be a problem. This is a pretty stiff bodice, so it should be holding its shape pretty well. I'm going to pull this off the mannequin at this point um, and start finishing up the final seams we're gonna leave the side seam open that'll be our last seam that we do and we're gonna finish off the top in the armhole and then we're gonna finally attach it to the stays um, and then we will have a fitting and i will attempt the sleeves which i have been neglecting more than neglecting um ignoring because i kind of really don't know what i want so we will see what we come up with So at this point, I am cutting out, surprise, more paper. This goes in the center back of the bodice inside of the cover. The Actually, the center back of the cover wraps over this paper, and that creates almost a placket that goes over the lacing. The paper is there just to sort of make sure it's stable and it keeps its shape without wrinkling or flipping open on the wear. So far, it works really great. I haven't had any problems with it, so we're going to continue using it. After I've inserted the paper into the center back, I then take the same Peter Sham ribbon that I've used on the skirts of the stays and apply that to the top edge of the bodice. Using a space back stitch, I stitch it to the fold line and then trim away the seam allowance to about 3 16 of an inch. This will be very helpful in making sure that the top edge of the bodice is smooth and not too bulky. Once I completed sewing the Peter Sham ribbon to the top edge of the bodice, I then attached the center back placket to the back of the stays. I first started by attempting to do a half back stitch, but as you can see from my very twisted needle and very labored stitching, this wasn't the best option. So I then switched over to a stab stitch, being very careful not to let the black stitch show on the white fabric on the back side. After I complete that, I go to the side pieces and whip stitch those into place. I'll explain a little bit more later on in exactly my process, but this will help keep the cover nice and smooth. Okay, so what I've done and what has taken multiple days at this point is got it perfectly smooth. Um, I had more trouble with it than I thought I was going to have. 
So it was fun. Um, ended up having to bring the model in, double checking it on her, noticed that there were some issues with the back, took everything apart, put it all back together again. So now we are at this point. Um, the back um, has been stitched down on the inside. So if I had pulled this away, I should have, well, I guess I can. We'll just put it back later. But if you pull this back, I have stitched this seam. I don't know if you can see that. I've stitched the, the seam on this side to the actual stays. So what I've done is I've opened the seam flat and taken the seam from this panel and stitched it to the stays, which is keeping this panel under tension and nice and smooth. Um, and I did the same on the front. So the front panel and the back panel are now completely attached to the stays. And the last thing I'm going to do is slip stitch the side seams together and then possibly lightly tack them down. I haven't quite figured out how I'm going to do that yet. Again, I have no idea if this is actually the way they did it in the period, but with the way the velvet is, I wanted to, the seam to be open. It's the only way I can think of doing it. Um, if this was silk, what I would do is actually run this panel flat that way and then fold this panel back and actually stab stitch the panels down. Um, that I know is period, but because the velvet's so bulky and I don't have an existing example of a velvet version of this style, there's no other way I can think of doing it. So that's just the way we're going to go with it. And hopefully that is period enough. It's period enough for me. Um, and then finally, when we are finished, we're going to clip all around the waist. I'm just going to flip it in. It's going to be a little bulkier than I want it to be, but I think it'll be okay. Um, somebody had a really great idea on Foundations Revealed to actually take these panels of silk, lay this flat, and then lay these panels over top of it. And if I hadn't done all the work of binding it and slip, um, whip stitching and slip stitching it down, I would have done that, but it is done. And what is done is done. And so we're just going to keep moving forward because we have a deadline to meet and we just need it to look really good for the photos. So pretty happy with it. Um, just needs some finalization. We're going to clean off the all the edges and then we are finished with this and we can move on to the rest of it. So yay. <laughs> After the bodice is completely smoothed, I then need to close up the side seam. As you can see, based on my original red stitch line, the side seam has kind of moved away from the side. So right now I'm just sort of finagling it into place. And then once I do that, I then take a needle and slip stitch the side seam shut. Not to worry too much about this, the velvet hides a lot of mistakes. If this was silk, I would have done it slightly differently, but with the velvet, the thread sort of gets lost in the pile and you know makes this a pretty easy job. Now that the cover is attached to the stays, I can then mark the armhole and trim away the excess. I can also go ahead and finish off the bottom edge of the cover and start attaching that to the skirts.
Once I complete that, I then take the same Peter Sham ribbon, cut it to the correct length, and then press it so that it has a nice curve to it so that I can apply it to the armhole. Doing this allows you to create a shorter side and a longer side, which then makes it easier to fold around a, a tight curve, especially like an armhole or skirts or something to that effect. I actually learned this trick in millinery school. Um, this is how they got the ribbons on the inside of the hat to lay flat against the hat itself. So it's a nice trick to know. It's a really old trick to know and it works really well. So you just take a really hot iron and a lot of steam and you bend the ribbon and press it at the same time into the shape that you want. So once you have attached the Peter Sham ribbon to the armhole, you then take the seam and trim it down to 3 16 of an inch and then fold the Peter Sham ribbon back over the edge of the stays and fell it down. And here's where you can see that curving that ribbon really helped create a nice smooth curve around the armhole and makes for a much neater finish. Thank you all so much for sticking around on this project. It's been a long one and I appreciate you all for your patience. In part three, we'll be drafting and attaching the sleeves and then this bodice will be done. So I hope you join me again. I really hope you all are enjoying this and learning something. Just remember to like and subscribe so you can get a notification on part three coming up next.